We're so happy that we are here. Even we have uh, busy schedules, we have uh, sometimes 24 hours work, <laughs> non stop working. Yeah, we believe that uh, this is the grace of God that we are here. Amen? And are you ready to listen to the Word of God? Okay, if you have your Bible with you, our message will be found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, from verse 1 up to verse 10. Ephesians 1, I mean Ephesians chapter 2, from verse 1 up to verse 10. Okay, let me read. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the way of this world, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised, up, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the in incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you, God, for gathering us in this place. Thank you for the opportunity to have fellowship with our fellow believers. And most of all, to enjoy your very presence in this place. As we gather here, we commit ourselves before you. And we, whatever sins that you have found in us, we ask for your, for your cl uh, cleansing to each one of us, Lord. Cleanse us with your holy blood, Lord Jesus. And we pray that as we listen to your message to us this morning, Open our hearts for you, O God. Remove all those hindrances in our mind so that uh, your, your, your message, Lord, will be freely and uh, will be according to your will. It happens to us as we listen to your word that you will speak to us. You will bless us, O God. And, pray, and, and as we pray, Lord, as we uh, not only us but also our brethren who is not here, we don't know what's going on with their lives, Lord. We pray that may you intervene with them, Lord God, and may you bless them also. So thank you, Father. May you bless each one of us as we listen to your word. And for me as your servant, as I deliver your word, Lord, may the Holy Spirit is the one who speak to us and teach us this morning. Father, we thank you. And uh, we ask that may, as we listen to it, not only listening, but help us to apply this in our daily life. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering. Hallelujah. So before we continue, do you know that the, the chapter, do you have your Bible with you? Do you know that the chapter and verse numbers uh, are such a familiar part of Bible reading, but we rarely give them much conscious thought? In fact, verse numbers are so integral to the way we talk about Scripture that it's hard to imagine the Bible without them. Can you imagine the Bible without chapters, without verses? But those numbers haven't always been there. The Old Testament has long been organized into sections and subsections. Our modern chapter and verse divisions generally correspond to the tradition, Jewish organization of the, of the text, but not always. While the Old Testament 
have been roughly organized at least since the Bible canon was established. It wasn't until 1,000 years later that, that something resembling our modern chapter and verse system was widely accepted. So the person credited with dividing the Bible into chapters is Stephen, Stephen Langton. Who is Stephen Langton? He is the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1207 to 1228. So while Langton's isn't the only organizational scheme that was devised, it is his chapter breakdown that has survived. Okay? But while chapters are useful, are a useful organizational tool, the ability to repair the specific phrases with those chapters would make the system even more usable. Well, it's Robert Stepanus, who is Robert Stepanus, a.k.a. Robert Stein, or Stein, created a verse numbering system in the mid-16th century and was the first person to print a, print a Bible with verse numbers in its chapter. Robert, is, uh, Robert Stein, or Stein, is well known as Robertus Stephanus in Latin, and sometimes referred to as Robert Stephens. Okay, he was a 16th century printer, a classical scholar in Paris, was the proprietor of the Stein print shop after the death of his father, Henry Stein. So the founder of Stein printing firm, Stein published and re uh, republished many classical texts as well as Greek and Latin translations of the Bible, known as printer to the king in Latin. In Hebrew and Greek, Stein's most prominent work was the Thesaurus Lingi, or Latine, which is considered to be the foundation of modern Latin lexicography. So additional to that, he was the first to print the New Testament divided into standard numbered verses. He was a former Catholic who became a Protestant late in his life. Many of his published Bibles included commentary which upset the Catholic theologians of the Sorbonne who, who sought to censor Stein's work. Eventually, Overcome by the prejudice of the Sorbonne, or so, so Sorbonne, Stein and his family fled to Geneva where he continued his printing uncensored, publishing many of the works of John Calvin. He became a citizen of Geneva in 1556 where he would die on September 1559. So the chapter and verse numbers we know and love today are direct descendants of these systems. Different languages and versions of the Bible occasionally make use of alternate, alternate systems, but our current chapter and verse system is almost universally understood. So, if you have King James Version, you will notice that our, our passage right now is it's like a, it's like one one paragraph. Okay, like what I said this people who made this Stephen Langton who divide the Bible into chapters and Robert Stephanus who created the verse numbering system. So right now we're going to focus on this passage of the book of Ephesians, especially from verse to eight from verse eight to ten. So as continuation of God's message to us last week of becoming born again, as the Lord Jesus himself told Nicodemus that the healing and the miracles, the signs and wonders that he performed is the sign of the Messiah that his purpose is to take us into the kingdom of God. Well, because he mentioned in John chapter 3, verse 3, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Amen? No one is, no one no people can enter heaven unless they are born again. So only born again people can be in heaven. So it is by receiving and believing in Jesus that makes a person born again. So after becoming born again, this, this is a, a big question. Now what? You say, oh, I receive, I believe in Jesus. 
and I'm a born again Christian. Now what? What is the next step that we should know? Our topic for this morning is I entitled it Christ character. Christ character. So we praise God. I heard that uh, Christine gave her testimony. We praise God for answering our prayer for Ryan and Christine to have a baby girl. How many prayed? Amen. We are not done yet. Let me tell you this. We are not done yet. Keep me your grace still in your prayer to have a normal and fully develop until she will be born. Amen? So I believe that it is God who, give, who gives children to the parents. As uh, Psalms, uh, the psalmist said, Behold, the children are a heritage and gift from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Because parents are God's steward. Let me remind you parents, including myself, our children is, our, is not ours. We're just God's steward. Amen? Amen? So don't be stingy to God. Don't say, my children is mine. These children is mine. No, it, it's, they're, they're, they are heritage. They are gifts. Amen? It is, they are from God. And one day you will free them. The Bible says they are like arrow. Okay? One day we will set them free. And do, during those days that they are in our care, we need to train them, guide them. And now, uh, because Christine will have a daughter, so she can disciple her daughter. Amen? If you're a, a, if you're a dad, you need to disciple your son. If you're a mom, you need to disciple your daughters. Amen? It's hard for those moms, say for example, to train to disciple your son. Maybe you can teach them many things, but being a man, you cannot teach them to become a man. Because you're a woman, right? But if you're in the situation of like that, being a single parent, the Bible is, is the one who will teach us and who will uh, guide us to train or to equip our, our children. Amen? So, because parents are God's steward to, to their children, we can ask God for it. I still remember before Nathan was conceived, I asked the Lord if it is His will for us to have another child and can still take care of the child, give us a boy. And after a month, my wife became pregnant, and guess what? He answered her prayer. It's a boy. If you are a parent or planning to be, or you know, in the future you will become, you will get married and planning to have children, you can ask God to give you what you want to be entrusted to you. You can ask God, Lord, if, you, if it's your will for me to have children, can you give me just two boys and one girl? <laughs> or two boys and two girls? You know, you can ask that if it's God's will. Amen? And, but, but you know what? Having a child or children wasn't that easy. Is that right? It's not that easy. After giving birth, there's a lot of things to do. Like becoming born again Christian. There's a lot of things that we need, we need to do. We have a lot of things to do after we believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because becoming born again or, say, or saved was too impossible for us, yet it is possible with God because it is by grace that you or a person will be saved. Amen? If we will recall our old life, according to our passage, the life before we truly become born again, we live like us, the ungodly. As the Bible says in our text, verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, okay, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. So former life, what is our former life? Everyone has their own former life, right? Before we became born again. The former life, we are spiritually dead. That's our former life. We don't care about spiritual things. If someone invites you to church, if someone encourages you to read your Bible, if someone asks you to pray, you don't care. Because you're spiritually dead. But when you believe, when you become born again, those things change. You became, became more interested in spiritual things. You became more interested in God. 
Amen? And when someone asks you to pray, you want to pray. Because prayer is talking to God, communication with God. When, you want, when someone asks you to read the Bible, you're so, so eagerly want to read the Bible because yet that's your daily life, reading the Word of God, understanding what God's plan for you. If you, someone asks you to share the Word of God, you are so absolutely will do it. That's your new life. So we're spiritually dead. That's our former life. Second, that in our, in our passage is we follow the ways of this world. How many are still imitating the things of this world? Many of us, we have idols. We have, you know, oh, I want to become like him. I want to become like that person. We idols that person. And we want to be like that person. That's our old life. Our pattern should be not in this world. The Bible says that is our former life. Followed, we follow the ways of this world. Amen? If the world is going to this direction, as the Bible says, narrow is the road that leads to eternal life, but wide is the gate that leads to destruction. If you count the, the census in our days, how many are in the church right now? And how many are outside there doing their own things? A lot of people, compared to the statistics that we can compare, the percentage, the small amount of people who are in the church listening to the Word of God every Sunday than those people who are outside doing their own things. Amen? Follow the ways of this world. That's our former life. The third former life is we follow the rulers or ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We are slaves of Satan. That's our former life. We are subject to sin. We don't have right to, di to, 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 to disagree with the enemy because the Bible says that is our former life. We follow the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In verse 3 tells us, all of us also live among them at one time. Okay, the former life that we have in this world is what? We live among them. It means we disobey. We are disobedient at one time. How many are, were disobedient before? We are so disobedient. If you are children, if you are so disobedient with your parents, that you are walking outside the will of God. But if you are an obedient child, that's the will of God for you to obey your parents. Amen? Amen. So the second former life in verse 3, it says we gratify the cravings of the flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Is that true? That we always think about ourselves. We always think about what, what is the best for us. That's why we always, uh, we, we always mention this song that they said that, uh, uh, what is the, the lyrics? Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Learning to love yourself. That's selfish. It's not biblical. We are not commanded by God to love ourselves. You don't find in the Bible, you cannot find any passage in the Bible that tells us to love yourself. Okay? We can find love your enemy as you love yourself. But it, the Bible doesn't teach us that you need to be self-lovable. Instead of that, that, the Bible is telling us we need to die to ourselves. Die to yourself. Because if you don't die to yourself, Christ will not live in you. But if you die to yourself, Christ will live in you. Amen? So we have that, we have that cravings of the flesh. We always have that, we, we want to do things that is not pleasing to God. Following its desires and thoughts. And the third, uh, the third former life in verse 3, it says that we are deserving of the wrath, of wrath of God. We are destined to be punished. That is our former life. We are destined to punish, to be punished by God. So I, I encourage you to pray to God that, that they will come to you to have a born again, a true born again experience, to have a new life, a life that is defined by God. 
if you have life with God, it is not others who define your life. It is not yourself who define your life. It is God who should, should define your life. Amen? In verse 4 in our text, But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. As the Bible says, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. You know what? God is so graceful. Can you say amen to that? God is so merciful. It is by grace that we can stand here and preach the word of God. It is by grace that you are sitting there listening to the word of God. Everything is about grace. Grace of God. Amen? If you will see, God is so graceful and he is so merciful. That is the package deal of salvation. The grace of God and his mercy. Mercy means compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is with one's power to punish or to harm. That's mercy. God can punish us. We are, we are guilty to be punished. But God's mercy showed upon us. Amen to that? We, God is so merciful. Well, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Amen? We are destined to hell, but God didn't punish us. We are not worthy to be in heaven, but God belongs us there. Ask yourselves right now, am I deserving to be in heaven? As the Bible said, there will be no more unclean things that will enter heaven. In Revelation 21 verse 27 says, Nothing impure will enter it. Nothing impure. Amen? If you say you are deserving, then you don't need God's grace. Is that right? I can't imagine if this is true. For those people who say, oh, I am worthy to be in heaven. If this is true, there will be a lot of boastful, self-righteous, and prideful people in heaven. Amen? Those people are there, you know, bragging for themselves. Oh, I'm a good person. That's why I'm here. But it can't be because it, it can't happen. As the Bible says, nothing impure will enter. Nor will anyone that's what the, is shameful or deceitful. Okay, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those names that were written in the books or in the Lamb's book of life. It is by grace, as the Bible says in our text, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Have you noticed this is not from yourselves? This is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. So, but if you say, I am not, not worthy to be in heaven, then you need God's grace to be in heaven. Amen? Because salvation is the gift of God, not by works. If salvation will be based in our good works, then you can't enter heaven. It is by grace, then the Lamb's book of life is your hope. For everyone who receive and believe in Jesus, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Anyone who accepts the redemptive work of Christ, he or she or his or her name will be written in the book of life. Make sure, my dear friends, make sure that your name is written in that Lamb's book of life. Amen? Because, you know, make sure you, you truly receive and believe Jesus. Because why? Because anyone, according to Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, anyone whose name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the final punishment of God. Make sure 
when you say you receive the Lord Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, make sure you do it seriously. Amen? No one can force us to accept the Lord Jesus. Maybe I'm saying you can pretend that you accepted, believe in Jesus, but you cannot fool God. God knows who belongs to Him. But if I, I encourage you, if you haven't received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do it. Commit yourself to God and ask for forgiveness and ask the Lord to save you. And as the Bible says, those who truly believe and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their names are now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That when you die, God will check your record of good works, your life here on earth, but you will not pass the test. Because if you measure your good works and your bad works, you sin more, right? But praise be to God that Lamb's book of life is our hope. That when we, we will be in the, in, the, in the judgment of God and then God will, if we see our, our life, we are not worthy to be in heaven. But praise be to God, it is by grace. It is the grace of God that we will be in heaven. Amen? For our future that was mentioned in verse 6, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. So we have our former life. We have now our future life. And the Bible says, And God raised us up with Christ. God raised us up with Christ. And seated with us, or seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order, in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace. Expressed in His kindness to us. In Christ Jesus. Remember this. God is the one who starts and will complete our salvation. Amen. If you are born in this world, you have a, your parents who will provide for your needs. But in reality, it is God who provides for you and for them. Amen to that. We have our Heavenly Father who provides for us. Whether Bad people, I can say this generally, whether bad people or good people, it is the Heavenly Father who blessed them. Biblically speaking, Matthew 5, 45 tells us that He causes our Father in heaven, causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He is so graceful, He is so merciful. As the Bible says in the book of Peter, that the reason why God is not judging, sending his judgment to everyone is because he wants more. He wants people to come to him in repentance. Amen? You know, there's two things. I mentioned this before. There's two reasons why we are still alive. First, God wants you to repent. To turn back to him. Second, the, re the second reason why you still exist, because God wants you to tell others about his salvation, about his grace. Amen? That's the two things that we should understand. So in salvation, remember, you don't have to do anything to be saved. But after you got saved, there's a lot of things to do. The Bible says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. When a person became a Christian, a born-again Christian, he or she became a new creation created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So Christ's character will become our character. Amen? Hello? We follow, we we. we we imitate Christ's character. So what is his character? His character is a righteous character. Remember, how many believers of Christ in this room this morning? If you are a believer of Christ, believer does not continue on sinning. 
when we were born by our bi biological mother, we are a product of a unrighteous person. Our parents are sinners, we became sinners. Amen? But when we became born again, we become or we became the product of a righteous person, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And because the one who caused us to be born again is righteous, our life now is to do good works. Amen to that? It is not by bragging about what you're doing. It is not, it is not to tell others you're doing the good things, but it is the result of your salvation because you are now saved. It is so important for you to fulfill your purpose. And that purpose is to do good works. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. This is God's plan for us since the beginning, as the Bible says, to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Maybe they say, tell me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Biblically speaking, you will become like the one whom you worship. As the Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 115, not to us, Lord. King David said, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. We always give thanks to God. We always glorify God. We always honor God. When someone praises you, you say, not to me. Not to me, but to the Lord to the Lord. Be all the glory. Be the glory. Amen to that? It is not us, Lord, but it is you because of your love, because of your faithfulness. All the glory must belong to you. Amen? But here in this passage, as King David said, why do, na do the nation say, where is their God? Compared to other nations, Israel, Israel's God is invisible. Invisible God. Our God is invisible. People who doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, those people who did not commit their lives to God, they're making fun of these things. That they say, oh, your imaginary friend. Right? But for us, we believe that God is spirit. We don't see him. But he sees us. Our former life is this, according to this passage. Those nations saying, we have our God here. Is, we can see our God. But how about you, Israelites? Israel, nation of Israel, where is your God? And verse 3 tells us that their God is in heaven. Let me tell you this, my friends, my dear brothers and sisters. Our God is in heaven. Amen? Our God is not staying here in this place. Our God is everywhere. Our God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Amen? This cross is not our God. This cross just reminds us the love of God, that Christ died on the cross for our sins. And don't consider this cross as your God. Amen? This is just a piece of wood. Don't worship this cross. Maybe some of you bow down here, you pray here, but don't pray to this cross. This cross is not our God. Our God is spirit. Amen? Or maybe you say, oh, Pastor, why don't we remove that cross? The cross is the symbol of the suffering of Christ. But our cross is empty to remind us that the redemption, the redemptive, redemptive work of Christ or the redemption that Jesus did on the cross is finished. He's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the grave. He is risen from the dead and he is now in heaven. Amen? So our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him according to verse 3. It is not God will do what pleases us. It is what pleases God. He will do everything that pleases Him. So don't question God about, Lord, I want this. 
do this, Lord. Don't dictate God. Don't you ever ask the Lord what pleases you. Always ask the Lord, Lord, what pleases you. It, let it be happen. And mostly, I can assure this, mostly, the things that pleases God is does, it doesn't please us. Amen? Most of those things. If you're a spiritual person, if you are if you live by faith, if the Holy Spirit lives in you, it connects that the things that pleases God, it pleases you. But if you're still in the former life, everything that pleases God, it doesn't please you. Amen. So our God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. Verse 4, but their idols, this is the, the, the nations who has their God, their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but they cannot see. They have ears but they cannot hear. They have noses but they cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel. Feet but cannot walk. Nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Verse 8, those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. So because Jesus Christ is righteous, we will become righteous. That's my point. And I believe and I pray that all of us here, we're, we're no longer worshiping idols. Amen to that? Because if you worship idols, if you have images at home, and you're still praying to that image, if you still pray... Uh, uh, thinking that the image is your God, you will become like that image or idols. They have mouth, they cannot speak, they have eyes, they cannot see, they, can, they have ears, they cannot hear, they have, they have uh, hands, they cannot move, nose, they cannot smell. So those are, because why? Because those are only things, created things, Okay, made out of silver, gold, or wood, or any expensive materials. Amen? But let me ask, tell you this again. Let me remind you because we are now serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is righteous. Tell this to the person next to you. You too will become righteous. Amen? Is there a good news? That's our hope. We will have his righteousness. Not your own righteousness, like what we said, we are sinners, but we will have the righteousness of Christ. That's the reason why God will not judge us, because we have this righteousness, the righteousness of his only begotten son. So God will create a new heart in us, so that we will not continue on sinning. Like what we mentioned, God is the one who started this salvation in our life, and he's the one who make it to completion. You don't have to do anything. Just give yourself to God and he will create a new heart in you. When Jesus became a man, when Jesus became man, he, being God became man, the Bible says he did not commit sin. Verse 5 of uh, the book of First uh, John chapter 3, it tells us that but you know, or but but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. A person who experiences a born again experience is sinless. Why? Because Jesus took away our sins. Can you imagine that? That's the spiritual reality. You don't have sin anymore. Why? Because Jesus took away your sins. Amen. Say this, Jesus takes away my sins. He took away my sins. Jesus is the only one who ever lived in this world who didn't commit sin. As the Bible says in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 15, I just underlined it, he was being tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So the temptation that we encounter, we face every day, is the same temptation that Jesus experienced. But the only difference, he did not give way to temptation. He was tempted. Being tempted is not, you're not sinning, but
but giving way or when you give way to the temptation, you are now sinning. Amen? So verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Why? Let me tell you this. What is sin? What is sin? What is the definition of sin? As the Bible says, we know that we are sinning if we don't do what is right. If you don't do what is right, you are sinning. And verse 7 says, Dear children, how many are chi God's children this morning? How many are God's children? Amen. Amen? Do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous just as he is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Because righteousness in the eyes of God, how many wants to become righteous? Do you want to become righteous in the eyes of God? Righteousness in the eyes of God is the one who does what is right. That is righteousness. We know that Abraham believed in God. And the Bible says God called it righteousness. Amen? He was called a righteous person. It means... What is right that was mentioned? What is right? The right that was mentioned here to do what is right is to obey God, to obey His Word. If you do the right thing, if you obey the Word of God, if you obey God, that is the right thing to do, to obey Him. Verse 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Who is the origin of sin? Who is the origin of, not, of doing what is not right? It is the devil. The devil. And as the Bible says, because he was sinning from the beginning. The reason, can you imagine, he was disobeying God since the beginning until now. Everything that he do is for against the will of God. If Satan didn't stop doing the things that is not right, we should not stop doing what is right as the children of God. Amen? The reason the Son of God, listen to this, the, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What is the devil's work? It is sin. It is to disobedient to God. That is his work. His work is he wants us, he wants to drag us to, to go back to our old life to our former life. That is what he's doing in, in, in his Christian's uh, life right now. He wants us to go back to our old life. But you know what? The good news is Christ ended our sinful character. When he died on the cross, when he rose from the grave, when you accepted, when you believe in him as your Lord and Savior, Christ ended the sinful nature in you. Satan always reminding us the sinful nature that we have, that we used to have. But Christ, the Lord, now is telling us that Christ ended that sinful nature that was our former life. We no longer slaves to sin. Our obligation now is to sin, but our obligation now is to God in obedience of Him. In verse 9, says no one is born of God will continue to sin. Do you believe that you are born of God? Do you believe that you experience a born again experience? If yes, let me remind you this. No one is born of God will continue to sin. Amen? Because why? Because God's 